one gospel lesson for tonight is taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12, beginning, chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. Now before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now the devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and wiped them with the towel that was tied around him. Jesus said to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to Jesus, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean and you are clean though not all of you for jesus knew who was about to betray him and for this reason he said not all of you are clean after he had washed their feet he put on his robe and he returned to the table and he said to them do you know what i have done for you you call me teacher and lord and you are right for that is what i am so if you, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set for you an example that you should also do as I have done. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than those who sent it. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify in himself, and he will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little while. You will look for me, and, and as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, a new mandate, that you are to love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Will the congregation please be seated? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on this Good Friday, I mean this Monday, Thursday, we thank you for the opportunity to gather at St. Paul's Wurttemberg tonight to discuss and to think about the meaning of the Passover event, the Passover Seder in which you gave us the new mandate to love one another. Lord, open our hearts and minds as we prepare for this next three days of Holy Week, as we walk with you to the cross and to the tomb. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, now tonight I'm gonna to do something a little different. I'm gonna talk about the first reading, which is taken from Exodus chapter 12. Why is that? Tomorrow is Good Friday, but it's also the first day of Passover. So it's important to know, starting right out, Jesus is what? An Orthodox Jew. Monday, Thursday, the giving of the Last Supper was not just a time where he said, okay, let's have communion. I have some communion wafers and I have some wine here. Let's do the communion thing so we can get on to business. That's not what it was about. It took place in the context of a Passover Seder. So if you want to get a deep understanding of who Jesus is and what happened that night, you need to go back to the first reading and figure out what the heck is going on here. So that's what we're going to do tonight. So let's take a look at this. First of all, if you want to understand Passover, Exodus chapter 12 is the place you want to look in the Bible. So the, uh, the Ten Commandments are in Exodus, same thing, the story of the Passover is also found in Exodus. Here it's Exodus chapter 12. So here we go. The Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, stop here for a minute. What's the story here? Remember, the book of Genesis ends with the sons of Jacob slash Israel, the same person, 
There are 72 people that are there. They stay in Egypt for 430 years. By the time of Moses, the population is about two and a half million. It's about two and a half million. And instead of being friends of Pharaoh like they were with Joseph, the Pharaohs had changed and they, be, they forgot who they were and they were enslaved. So the Hebrews were enslaved for generations and generations in Egypt. And they called out for liberation. They called out to God saying, remember us. We want liberation. We want freedom. So what did God do? God's plan was to send Moses. And how do you think of the life of Moses? Very easy. 20, uh, 40, 40, 40. 40 years in the court of Pharaoh. Remember, he's the basket he's adopted. 40 years, he's in the Sinai Peninsula on the run, living like a, like a, a fugitive. And 40 years leading the children of Israel through, through the, uh, the, the, the wilderness wandering. So, this, so God calls Moses at age 80 to go back to Egypt and to lead the children of Israel out. So God calls Moses and Aaron, that's his brother who's the priest, they go to the land of Egypt. And this story takes place, it says, this month shall mark to you the beginning of months. Now, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. Easter Sunday is the first Sunday after the first full moon of the spring equinox. The Jewish calendar is also a lunar calendar and it's in sync. Sometimes Passover hits at about the same time, like it does this year, right? Friday is the first day of Passover. Other times it's off by a week or two, depending on, but typically they're, they're pretty close. So it's a lunar calendar and, it, it, you, and, and this should be celebrated every year, every year. It's an annual festival, like the 4th of July or Memorial Day for us. And you are to tell the whole congregation on the 10th of the month, they're to take a lamb for each family. Okay, one lamb per household. Stop for a minute. Where is Jesus born? He's born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is about six miles south of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is a place where the lambs are raised that are used in the temple sacrifice. So it's like right, it's like right down the road from the temple. And so it's appropriate that Jesus, who's called the Lamb of God, is born in the Bethlehem where the lambs are raised for the temple sacrifice. And what does it say? It says the whole congregation. So this is millions of people have to follow this now. Um, and what are you supposed to do? It's very specific. Orthodox, the word orthodox means right practice, where you follow what the text says. So there's very specific details on how you're supposed to do this thing. You can't just say, oh, I don't like lamb, let's have chicken this year. That's not how it works. You have to have lamb, right? And if the household is too small, what do you do? It's only Mrs. Isaac, the only two of us. We're happy. Yeah, the girls are all married and gone. When they're coming back, we change the locks, right? So we're happy now. So we would have to go together with our neighbor. Go to your closest neighbor, and you split a lamb, and you divide it up. Now, what is the lamb supposed to be? It's supposed to be without spot or blemish. Now, the lamb used in the Passover meal is a type, and Jesus is the anti-type. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In other words, he's the Lamb without spot or blemish. He's a man without sin. That's where that comes in, right? And a one-year-old male, right? And you are, you are to take it, it can be either a sheep or a goat. In other words, you can, have, you can have a young goat or a young sheep. So in other words, you can use sheep meat or goat meat. It doesn't matter, right? And what are you supposed to do? You are to keep it until the 14th day of the month. You got this? Uh, what is this all about? Basically, you take the lamb. Are lambs cute? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. They're very cute, right? Um, and basically, you adopt the lamb, and it becomes like a household pet. You keep it for 14 days in your house, mm -hmm. right? Well, why is that? Well, on the 14th day, the whole assembly of the congregation will slaughter it at twilight. Mm -hmm. Well, what's that? That's called the day of preparation. Josephus says that on Good Friday, right, tomorrow is Good Friday, Passover, 30,000 lambs are slain in the temple, the day of preparation. So you have this lamb that's like your pet for 14 days, and you bring it, and the lamb, the throat is cut and the blood is shed. 
And the temple in Jerusalem, again, I've, I've made this analogy before. We think of St. Patrick's Cathedral, the white marble. We think of our church. It's all beautiful and clean and nice, you know. Bobby Choupe and the ladies work really hard to keep it looking good. Well, a temple, the temple where, that Jesus would have known would have been a place where it would have been a foot of running blood. It would have been lamb blood all over the place. The priests are basically... Uh, they slaughter the sheep. That's what they do. That's part of the part of the ritual. And what do they do? Then they are to um, they 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 are to collect the blood, right? What is this all about? It's a three-hour lecture, right? It goes back to remember the book of Genesis, Cain and Abel. Remember that story? Okay. What happened? Cain and Abel went out and they and they offered sacrifices to God. Cain offered fruits and nuts. In other words, fruit of the ground, a bloodless sacrifice. Abel offered a lamb, the blood of the lamb. God accepted Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain's sacrifice. So what did Cain do? Out of envy and out of jealousy, Cain killed Abel. So that's called the scarlet thread of redemption. There's a thread that starts in the, with Cain and Abel, and it runs through the entire Bible. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Now, is the shedding of blood offensive to you? Yeah, that's pretty nasty, right? Can't we just do it another way, the Cain way? Well, again, orthodoxy is following what God told us to do. What kind of a God would tell you to pick a lamb, an innocent animal, and have it live in your house for 14 days and be your pet, and then take it to the temple and kill it. What's the point of that? The point of it is for you to know the seriousness of sin. Your sins are not just, oh, I'll just pardon everybody. Oh, just forget it. Sin's not really that bad. <clears throat> Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. In other words, it's a serious sin is a serious thing. It's so serious that some innocent animal has to die in order for your sins to be absolved. That's called the scarlet thread of redemption. Sometimes I'll have to do like a seven-hour sermon and go through all the references in the Bible that start out. And it's a, it runs all the way through the Bible. It's not a new idea that was just, you know, Jesus made it up or something, right? So without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so... You, you have the day of preparation, everyone slaughters it, and you're to take some of the blood, and this is where it gets really interesting. You take some of the blood and put it on your two doorposts and the lintel of the door. What does that mean? See that door over there? That door, if you look at the door, there's a cross there, isn't there? Right? Well, you're supposed to take a, the, the bowl of blood and you dip a hyssop branch on it and you make a mark on the door. And you put the door, you put it like this. One, two, three. In other words, it's the shape of the cross. The shape of the cross. Why is, why is that? The lamb's blood, the shape of the cross, is on the door. And what, how does the story work? Well, when, um, when the, 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 this, this event is Passover. What does Passover mean? God sends the angel of death to slay the firstborn of each of the Egyptian families. And when the angel of death gets to a house that's marked with the blood of the lamb, the shape of the cross, the angel of death passes over the house. Passes over the house. Yeah, but putting the lamb's blood is a stupid thing. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm not going to do it. Okay. Well, then you die. You see how this works? We always think that, that God's ways of salvation are ridiculous and stupid. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. You see what it is? Again, human logic is, is the opposite of the way God works. God says to do it, and it's not up to you to complain and argue with God about it. Oh, that doesn't make sense, it's stupid. Okay, Cain, right? So that works? So we have, we have this envy and rebellion in our heart. We don't want to do it God's way. We want to do it our way. No, you have to do it God's way. God tells us, to, he gives very specific directions on how to do this. So what are you supposed to do then? So 
So um, you slay the lamb, you put the blood on the doorpost, and then you were to eat the lamb on the same night. Okay? So the, the Passover is a ritual, a ceremony, and it's in the home. And it's in the home to teach the younger people the story and tradition of the Hebrew people. One of the problems, you know, I teach history, right? And I don't know what's worse, teaching economics or teaching history. When you teach history, I don't know what they do in high school. The kids are completely blank. They've never heard of people like Abraham Lincoln before. So you say, he's the one with the $5 bill? Honestly, if you don't know the history of your country, if you don't know the history of what made our country great, like the Holy Bible, if you don't know the history, how do you expect to know about God, right? Passover is a family ceremony held in the house where you teach the next generation the story, the story, the Exodus story. For us, the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ, Easter, that's why we're called Christian. For us, it's all about the resurrection of Christ. For the Jewish people, they are born out of bondage in Egypt. They were nothing. A slave in the ancient world is a non-person. Nothing. Non-person. Okay? And they were born, reborn, with Moses, who led them out of, the, out of slavery, and they became a nation in the wilderness for, during the 40 years of wilderness wandering. It's extremely important. Right? So knowing your history is vital for this. And so you are to kill the lamb, eat the lamb, roast it over a fire, and you are to eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Again, in a Passover Seder, I should have brought the Seder plate down here. It's a ritual that goes along each one of the things. The bitter herbs are to remind you of slavery. There's salt water to remind you of the tears shed during the slavery. The hard-boiled egg is to remind you of the temple, right? Um, and you were to roast it, and you were to leave none of it to remain, right? None of it remains, right? Um, and then if there's any left over, you burn it. And when you eat it, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to gird up your loins and have your sandals on your feet and your walking staff in your hands. What do you mean? This is a meal that takes place on the night of the exodus, the night of the departure from slavery. In other words, you pack up and you leave. You have to be, it's sort of, sort of like, you ever go on vacation? The night before vacation, you know, we used to drive to Minnesota. We'd get up at like five o'clock in the morning. You couldn't sleep all night because we're so anxious to get in the car and drive out there. Well, it's like the night of a vacation meal. You eat something fast. At my house, we always had to drink up all the milk because we're gonna be gone for two weeks. So you have unlimited milk that night. So it's a, it's a last minute meal. You're supposed to eat it and be ready to go. Again, and you do the Passover Seder this way to act out the ceremony to teach it to the next generation. This is how we keep it alive. And why? It is, this is called the Passover of the Lord. Notice, it's Passover of the Yahweh, Passover of the Lord. It's not your Passover, right? It's the Passover of the Lord. This is a night in which, in which the Lord did a mighty act. Why? I will pass over the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn of the land of Egypt, both humans and animals. You got this? Not only do they take the firstborn child or daughter of each family, they also take the firstborn of the animals in the flock. Again, the word capitalism, kappa means head. How many heads of cattle do you own? So again, you're gonna like wipe out the herds along with the families. Again, in the ancient world, the more children you have, the more powerful you are, the family, clan, tribe. So in other words, this is like a, this is gonna be a devastating loss for Egypt. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgments. Again, this is a three hour lecture. There are 10 plagues. Each one of the plagues is a personal insult. It's Yahweh is better than the Nile River God. Nile is greater than the, uh, the frog god, right? The, the Egyptians have animal gods. Each one of the plagues is a personal insult showing that Yahweh is superior to all of the Egyptian gods. In other words, the gods of Egypt aren't going to protect you. Only Yahweh will protect you. And then he says, I am the Yahweh. You got this? God has acted. 
God will act. God acted in history. And the blood, the blood on the houses shall be a sign. And I will know where you live. And where I see the blood, I will pass over you. In other words, we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by works of the law. The blood of the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In other words, this thing is loaded and saturated with meaning. When we read the Passover Seder, we see Christ as the Lamb who's offered up for sacrifice. And no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a remembrance to you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Again, it's not a festival that you do. It's a festival to the Lord. It's the Lord's Passover. Throughout all generations, you shall observe this as a perpetual ordinance. You got this? In other words, you're supposed to talk about it and teach the young people of every generation. When you forget who you are, that's Satan's goal, to get you to forget who you are. Who are you? You're a child of God. You're a Christian. You believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. That's, what, that's, who, that's your identity. Okay? Very, very important. Um, and so, what does all of this have to do with the Last Supper? Well, tonight, the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus did what? He took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it. He does the Passover Seder prayer. He breaks the bread. This is my body. He gives a new meaning to the Passover Seder. Instead of saying, this is unleavened bread that you eat, in our, this is like a hardtack that you ate during the Civil War, it's like rations. No, this, this bread is my body given for you. Again, after supper, what does he do? He takes the cup. When? After supper. In the Passover Seder, there are four libations, toasts that you give to Yahweh. The fourth toast is the one you do at the end of the meal, at the very end. It's like an after-dinner drink, right? He, gets, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave all the drinks, said, this cup is the new covenant or testament in my blood. Stop. What's the Old Testament? The Old Testament, oh, that's the 39 books in the front of the Bible that we never read. Now, that, that precedes the 27 books of the New Testament that we never read, okay? So the 29 books of the Old Testament is the name of the Bible, but it's also a name of what? The Old Covenant, the Old Agreement, the Old Testament. Last Will and Testament, okay? In Jesus, we have the New Testament, the New Covenant, or the New Agreement. In the Old World, you, you observe Yahweh by practicing the law, practicing the rituals, doing the right thing, being orthodox. In the New Testament, we have a new agreement, a new covenant. And we're saved by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. You got that? It's a new agreement. Do we have, do we raise a lamb and, and slaughter the lamb and bake the lamb and put the blood on our doorpost? No, why not? Because when Christ died on the cross, he says on the cross, we'll talk about this tomorrow night, it is finished. What does that mean, it is finished? It means that the temple sacrifice system is finished. It's over. We don't need a temple anymore. We don't do animal sacrifice. We don't, we don't kill 30,000 lambs on the day of preparation anymore. We don't have priests with bloody robes and knives walking around slaughtering animals. Why? Because Christ's death on the cross, the Lamb of God, is sufficient to cover the sins of all people who believe in him before, during, and after his life. You got that? So Jesus replaces the lamb, the ritual, the temple ritual, the temple service. And instead, we believe in the blood of Christ over the lentil and over the doorpost of our heart. Right? So in Christ, with his death, he dies on the cross for our sins. That is the essence of the Christian religion. It's extremely important. And Jesus says, not only did, does he have the Last Supper, but he also, he also gives a new commandment. This is why it's called Monday Thursday. It means mandatum novum. It means the new, the commandment new. Novum is commandment, mandatum, right from the Vulgate Latin. I give you a new commandment that you are to love one another as I have loved you. And you should love one another. 
For everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one another. The word love is what? Agape, willing to die for the sake of the other person. Christ is the embodiment of agape love. He died for you. Willing to die for the sake of the other person is what agape love is all about. That's what he says when he says love one another. Willing to put your own ego to death to raise up another person. Willing to serve another person. Willing to assist people around you and not try to get the glory for yourself. That's the new mandatum. So on this Monday, Thursday, we have a lot to think about. Take the bulletin home and go home and read over Exodus chapter 12, 1 through 14. Read it over a few times and think about what we talked about here tonight. Amen. Amen.